Okay, moving, uh, moving on. Um, so we have Anne Kusmans. Is she here? Marvelous. That's very good. So um, Anne is a gynecologist, but she's um, now working in research, um, and her, her interest has been in immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. But I think she is going to talk about um, some new research in terms of what the new development in IOTA, which we've called trans. Well, I didn't say trans IOTA. I think Sarah Blagden said trans IOTA. But anyway, we're going to say we called it trans IOTA. We don't care. Um, uh, and this session is on uh, essentially more translational medicine. So um, we're going to have Anne speaking about this, and Sarah is going to speak about um, post transcriptional gene regulation. Probably LARP will cr creep its way in there somewhere, I have a suspicion. Uh, um, some novel markers. Uh, and proteomics, and then we're going to have a discussion at the end if there's time. Uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of bars in Leuven which you may choose um, to go to. So, um, Anne, are your slides up? Yes. Perfect. Okay, off you go. Thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce the session about translational research in improving the diagnosis of ovarian cancer. Uh, so. Uh, this is basically what we want to do with trans iota or translational iota. Um, I think all of you know what translational means. It's basically finding a problem in the clinic, bringing it to the lab, finding a solution in the lab, and bringing it back to the clinic. Um, so if we look again back to the ADNEX model, um, what we saw is that CA125, which is the most common known biomarker in ovarian cancer, improved the uh, quality of our model, certainly uh, in discriminating between the several stages of ovarian cancer, discriminating between metastatic and uh, just primary cancer. So the question is now, is there a possibility to look for other biomarkers that can maybe aid to this model, that can help us find better models that can help us uh, optimize the ADNEX model, maybe, or maybe there's a combination of certain biomarkers. Now, if we talk about a biomarker, there are some requirements. Uh, first of all, it has to be representative for the whole tumor, and that's a problem, because we know that tumors change over time. Uh, that the primary tumor and the metastatic tumor are not the same. They express different tumor-associated antigens. They have a ge different genetic profile. So it's a problem mapping the whole genome, of uh, the whole tumor. Um, there also have to be clear discrepancies between benign and malignant masses. And it has to be detectable, preferably, in a non-invasive or minimally invasive manner. Uh, so then you can take repeated samplings for this biomarker. So as I told you, the problems with tumor heterogeneity, tumor accessibility, and tumor dynamics. So then we come to the topic of the liquid biopsy. What is actually a liquid biopsy? If you look at it at a word, it is a non-solid biopsy of the total tumor, of something that the tumor secretes. And originally, it was defined as a blood sample to sample some genetic material from the tumor. But in theory, everything that is secreted by the tumor can be biopsized by a liquid biopsy. And that increases the potential. So originally, in the original definition, you have the circulating tumor DNA, you have the circulating tumor cells, but you also can detect immune cells. You can detect proteins like CA125, but you can also take, detect phospholipids. If we put this in a scheme, we arrive at this, and this will be the goal of trans-IOTA. First, I'm going to start with the most novel marker, or the most novel piste that is uh, taken in this type of biomarker searching, about the phospholipids. It has become more and more clear that alterations in the lipid metabolism can be a marker for cancer in general. Um, and but the problem is the studies that have been there are merely on tissue, and it's very limitedly studied. 
studied. In our research center here, we have the group of Johannes Swinnen, who is actually doing this kind of studies. And I have received of him a, um, a recently accepted article where they searched for this plasma, uh, for these uh, lipid changes uh, in non small cell lung cancer tissue. This is the result. <laughs> so, I'm not a lipidomic uh, lady, uh, so this is his material. But uh, what the graph actually shows is if you take 73 patients of, with lung cancer together, their tissue at least, um, and then you can see, compared to healthy controls in red, you can see the lipids that are increased in those kind of patients, cancer patients, and in green, the lipids that are decreased. So you can clearly see that it is not the same as a healthy individual, because then it would be a mix of something between green and, uh, and red. So you can clearly see that there are certain lipids increased and decreased. So the profile of a patient with lung cancer is different from a healthy control. And they could even do more than that. There are two. Um, major histological subtypes of this type of lung cancer. And you can see indeed that you can see indeed that uh, there is even a discrepancy in this lipid profile to discriminate between the two major histological subtypes. So there is some future in this approach, but once again, the studies are very limited, especially in ovarian cancer. There's almost nothing known. Um, but coming back to the liquid biopsy, yes, they have done studies in plasma, but even more limited to the ones in tissue, but it's hopeful. Now we come to the genetics. Okay. The genetics, and I think most of you have heard something about it. It's the most common part, and also in cancer, genetics is being the best studied parameter. And this is actually a nice picture showing how a cancer can secrete things. It can secrete tumor cells, so tumor cells that loosen from the cancer or that are traveling through the blood vessels away to the metastatic site. Um, but cancer cell can also go into necrosis or apoptosis and release its DNA. And then you arrive with a cell-free tumor circulating DNA. This cell-free circulating tumor-derived DNA, it's a very short base pairs. Um, and like I said, the origin from apoptosis of cancer cells. So what happens, they get released from the dying cell um, and then they get a phagocyte, uh, they, they undergo phagocytosis by a macrosome and the uh, DNA is released. It's detected mainly in plasm or best in plasm. It's easier to detect than circulating tumor cells and the levels correlate with tumor burden. Uh, this is actually the uh, research of the PhD of Adrian van der Stichelen, who normally is present in this room. Um, so uh, he is actually looking in this in detail for ovarian cancer because at this moment, the ovarian cancer data are still limited. But it can be detected. Circulating tumor DNA can be detected in ovarian cancer, as this uh, graph shows. And there is also a discrepancy between benign uh, ovarian cysts and control patients. Now, there are two ways of looking at uh, tumor DNA, circulating tumor DNA. That is actually a very targeted sequence sequencing, this means an in-depth analysis. So what you're actually going to do is examine the exosome in detail. So if this is the whole genome, the exosome, which consists of the exons, uh, is only 1% of this DNA. And in that part, you're going to look for a very specific mutation. You can look for somatic mutations, you can look for methylation. The problem is that you then have to know what you have to look for. You have to know the mutations. That's a bit of a problem with ovarian cancer. We have P53, we have KRAS, a few others, but more research has to be done to know exactly what type of mutations are very prone in ovarian cancer. 
You can also look at uh, circulating tumor DNA at a different way, and you can do whole, sequ whole genome sequencing. It's more superficial. You don't look in depth. You don't look to the mutation. You just look at copy number variations of the circulating tumor DNA compared to healthy controls, for instance. Um, and um, this has been done already. And actually, the technique is the same as what was developed initially for pregnant patients being the non-invasive prenatal test. I think most of you know this, but this NIPT technology is actually screening this whole genome. What you're looking for is not the tumoral DNA, hopefully, but the fetal DNA in this case. But then you can see, indeed, you do this massive sequencing of the whole genome, and you can count the copy number variations, and for instance, in this, uh, in this case, there is too much, and you have the trisomy 21. To illustrate it with a case, how it can work in cancer, this is a, a case uh, of a pregnant patient reported in our hospital, 40 years old, 16 weeks, receiving a NIPT test in case of the for the pregnancy. But uh, as the graph shows, uh, normally, this should be all lines, so these are all the chromosomes, huh? and these should be all lines, so there shouldn't be outliers. And actually, what you see here, there are all outliers. There's nothing normal. And it's, a typically, it's typically, apparently, uh, uh, with ovarian cancer, that there is nothing normal, that there are copy number variations in several genes. And so this patient was then re referred back to ultrasound, and the diagnosis was made of an ovarian cancer. Now, what about circulating tumor cells? Um, so then we look at the cellular level in the blood. Um, it's a little bit different. There's more being published, but the problem there is there are several methods being used, so it's difficult to compare the studies. Um, different techniques, some look at mere enumeration, so just counting the amount of tumor cells. Some look at the molecular level, at the RNA level, and you have a lot of conflicting results. And also, they are rare. In one review published in Nature, they speak about less than 10 circulating tumor cells per 7.5 million blood, a mil milliliter of blood. This is an overview, a short overview, of what has been published in ovarian cancer, and you can clearly see that the amount is very uh, variable, the amount of detected disease, uh, CTCs, but what is reassuring is that in healthy controls, it is not, or slightly present. But anyway, for circulating tumor cells, there is some more work to do, about, especially about the techniques. Then about immune cells. This is my own uh, field of study, as Tom already said. Um, so. The immune system has been ignored for a very long time in the development of cancer. And in 2013, science called the development of immunotherapy the breakthrough of the year. And it's not only from that moment on that the immune system became visible for the world, uh, but anyhow, it, uh, it meant a serious uh, change in the way of thinking about the immune system. This is the most important scheme to know something about the immune system and cancer development. This is the normal tissue. What happens, because of several reasons, uh, the, tu the tumor can develop. So neoplastic cells arise um, amongst the uh, healthy cells. And then the immune system comes into action. And very often, it succeeds it to eliminate these neoplastic cells. And then you have this complete elimination, steady state, person is healthy again. You didn't see it as a clinician, but it happened. But what also happens is that the immune system can react on this, but only partially. And then you come, you still keep these uh, malignant cells, but kind of in a dormant state. You reach an equilibrium. It can stay like this, but it can also escape the immune system. We know the tumor can. It's very smart, it evades, it changes, and it escapes the immune system. It produces things that will even attract more immune cells, that will even worsen the immune situation for the immune system, and the tumor can escape totally. And at that moment, the tumor becomes clinically apparent for the clinician. I think this is a little bit information to be added to the discussions we already had today. There are 
several cells of these immune suppressive cells playing a role in this whole negative immune envir environment so that the tumor can escape the control. For ovarian cancer, I think that uh, there are three main cells uh, most, most important that are the regulatory T cells, the myelin derived suppressor cells, and the tumor associated macrophages. And I will invite you to uh, look at the paper in the Facts, Views, and Visions uh, leaflet that you got, uh, written by our group about these cells. Um, but to come back to the discussion we had and about um, not seeing the cancer early enough on ultrasound, uh, maybe indeed when we look at this liquid biopsy to detect some immune cells, it's actually what we are doing already now in uh, mice that are bearing ovarian cancer. If we follow these mice, we inject them with a tumor and we follow these mice uh, during the development of tumor, it's something we cannot do in patients uh, because we don't know when is moment zero. Um, then we can see, clearly see that the immune system is changing at week two, at four weeks after tumor inoculation, six weeks later, eight weeks later. We see the changes in the immune system, although we don't see the cancer arising already at that time in the mouse. So there, the immune system is indeed controlling the cancer and reacting to that. And then at last, what we also can detect, of course, in a liquid biopsy are the proteins. <laughs> and the most known to everybody is the CA125, but also EG4. There have been also done proteomics studies, but I think my colleagues who are coming next to this talk, Tom van Gorp and Dora de Franchi, are going to talk more about that. Also, Sarah Blackden is going to give a talk. But Proteins are not only the tumor markers that, that we know, the CA125, CA15.3, that are tumor markers, but there are other proteins, enzymes, interleukins as well, that can be measured in serum. If we come back to these immune cells, for instance, this is a study of my own group, um, you have these tumor-associated macrophages, regulatory T cells, and myeloid-derived suppressor cells, again, they secrete proteins like CCL2, VGF, most of you will know, I think, IL-10, TGF-beta, uh, transforming growth factor beta, they secrete it. And what happens, actually, if this immune system starts to move and starts to become more and more immune suppressive, those proteins that they secrete, they all influence each other and they all influence these immune suppressive cells so that you get um, a spiral, actually, of immune suppression that cannot be stopped anymore. So they all, all interact with each other, and they, with autocrine and paracrine effects, they um, make each other stronger. So what we did in ovarian cancer patients at diagnosis, but also after therapy, we looked at these proteins to see, can we detect something? Can we see their, those changes? And can our current therapies influence them? And indeed, so, if you look at ovarian cancer patients that's diagnosis versus controls, so that's already reassuring that uh, the values in ovarian cancer patients are higher for uh, at least IL-10 and TGF-beta, which are the worst immune suppressive uh, proteins. But what happens after chemo, huh? so this is neoadjuvant chemo, uh, carboplatin-based uh, uh, chemotherapy. Um, platin platin and carboplatin-based chemotherapy. So we get a decrease in all these negative markers. We get an increase in galactin-1. Galactin-1 is also um, a worsener of the immune system. And Mary studied in uh, brain cancer. Um, but it's classically seen that it increases with uh, chemotherapy uh, in brain cancer, for instance. So our results are not that surprising here. But also after debulking, we get a decrease of this marker. So we do something good, um, we, can, we can show it, but this also proves that the immune system might be a reliable partner to follow. And also these markers could be related independently of the FIGO stage to uh, progression-free and overall survival. So to summarize what I've been telling you, once again, we want to find new biomarkers. There are some requirements. We have 
to have the whole tumor, and we have to take into account that it's changing itself, itself constantly. So, coming back to the scheme, proteins we can detect in serum, uh, tumor DNA and phospholipids we can detect in plasma, circulating tumor cells we can detect in whole blood, and immune cells we can detect at the level of white blood cells. So actually, yes, they're all liquid biopsies. So, if a patient is diagnosed with an ovarian cyst, benign or malignant, you can actually take one blood sample, well, in theory it will be 35 ml, but one blood sample, and then you can analyze these five parameters at the same time. It is technically possible. So this last, this is my last slide, um, this gives an overview of what we will do. So try to look at the circulating tumor cells, circulating tumor DNA, but there will also be immune cells, there will be proteins, and there will be lipids. Thank you. Many thanks, Anne, for that sort of, oops, <laughs> almost lost you. Um, uh, any questions or comments, which was a kind of, um, kind of a very nice summary of the whole field, really, as much as anything, I think, and introduces the other speakers as much as, I think we'll get more detail later on from other speakers, I think. If you're going to put, if you're going to bet your house on any of these, which one, where would you put your money, basically? Well, I have to defend my, defend my own field of the immune cells, but uh, so I really believe in the immune cells. It, it's really something that is coming up, but I also believe in the circulating tumor DNA, if you look at the data. Circulating tumor cells, I, I think so in, in a few years, uh, but we're not there yet with the technology. And the plasmas, it's, it's limited information that we have at this moment. It's promising, but it's limited. So I will go for the circulating tumor DNA and the immune cells. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll come back and have your house in maybe a year or two, who knows. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's the thing about new technology, isn't it? There's, there's a sort of Gartner, you familiar with the Gartner curve for, for new technology? You, know, you have a technology and then you get the, what's it called? It's the, uh, the peak of expectation, then the trough of disillusion, and then you get the sort of the reality of where it really sits. And, Sometimes this, this it sometimes happens, and you have fantastic results with late stage cancer, and then you start getting more early and borderlines, and and then the real position of any new technology come, comes in. Uh, uh, question, Antonia, at the front. Uh, sorry. Do you see the future for these uh, new, brilliant uh, uh, perspectives in terms of uh, diagnosis or in terms of uh, screening in high risk patients, something like that? In terms um, that's of, a good uh, question. Cost, uh, and uh, everything all yeah. together. Um, uh, so we basically designed it now for the diagnosis, to aid in the diagnosis. Um, but we're currently doing studies for circulating DNA and uh, for immune cells, uh, also to um, monitor patients and to give them a personalized approach on how they should be treated, on the way the cells change, on the way the tumor DNA changes. Um, so we're currently doing these two studies. About screening, yeah, I think we will need more data about that first to see if we can do it. And also uh, doing, uh, analyzing proteins is quite uh, okay at this moment and it's quite uh, commercial, some of them. Huh? Um, but for instance, circulating tumor DNA is not at this moment, so we have to advance more further in this becoming, before coming to screening. Okay, I think we're going to have to, um, to finish with that. Thank you very much indeed, Anne.